Okay, guys, very welcome back to the show. Very, very special guest on the show, a man that was in the wrestling industry for a very, very, very long time, and we're going to find out how he decided to go down this road. Mr. Lou Marconi, how are you doing today, man? Oh, I'm doing well, sir. Thank you. I have, I'm happy to be here, and uh, it's a beautiful day here in uh, Northeast Ohio in the States. <laughs> yeah, I was I was looking. I got in contact with you, obviously, through Instagram, and then yeah, here we yeah. are having a conversation, and then I, I always... I always look up wrestlers' interviews just to see. I don't uh -huh. want to ask them the same questions all the time. And I couldn't find okay. any of you. I couldn't <laughs> find any of you on YouTube. Uh, I, God, it's been a while since I don't. That's what I think I did one was for Alan Funk, and he was just asking me just questions, you know, like, you know, what was the coolest moment you ever had in the business? And I'm happy to answer it. So <laughs> that was an interesting question. But yeah, anything you want to ask, man. I'll play, yeah, I, I've done interviews. I get asked for them, so it's I'm happy for. I'm happy to do them. Yeah. Um. The first thing I'll, I I ask anyone from the wrestling business is, mm -hmm. how did you decide that this was the journey, the path that you were going to go down? Oh man, I'd say it had to be when I was in high school, and I was a fan. And I'm talking. I grew up in high school. There was two major companies on TV every weekend. WWF and it was the Crockett's, the NWA. And we knew everybody yeah. knew who Ric Flair was. And, you know, my favorite growing up was Magnum TA and the dark side of the ring about him was actually, I, I liked it. It was a good episode. Um, what I would say too, is that it was like heartbreaking for the fans when that happened, because he was on a trajectory to who knows where he could have gone. And he was, he, he was yeah. a great wrestler. He was my, he was my favorite when I was, uh, I want to say, God, what, what year was that accident? Was it 87, 86? I think around then. Yeah. Yeah. I was in middle, I was in middle school, just going into high school around that time. Yeah. I was about 13 or 14 years old. So it, yeah, it was real tough, but I wanted, yeah. Whatever. Since when I was in high school, I said, I've, even my friends growing up that I still see today, you know, the people I went to, they said, man, they, they, they're so proud of me that I did it because I said, you always said you were going to do it and you went out and you did it. And I said, well, not, not too many people could say they did that. So I went, at least I gave it a shot. I said, well, if I try and I fall on my face, at least I tried. So it looks like I yeah. did okay. <laughs> so thanks. Was it, was it 1993 when you started wrestling training? That's what it says online, but it, you can never yes, be quite sure. Yes. Yeah. What, what happened was, let me just kind of give you a little bit. I, um. In high school, I my, the wrestling background was with my brother mostly because my brother was a state champion, excellent amateur wrestler, and went to college and wrestled. I, I wrestled with him more than anything, and I did uh, football and baseball just like any other, you know, American boy growing up. I did that, and then I, when I got out of high school, I went into amateur boxing. I just wanted to do it, and I did that for yeah. about two years. Where I was just doing amateur shows around Cleveland and gym, 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 gym fighter. You know, just I, I knew how to defend myself, which was a good. It's always good for a young man to learn that. I was at a gym working out, and there was a guy there that was a bodybuilder and a wrestler. His name was Ron Cumberlidge. I knew who he was. I was a fan, so I just approached him. I asked him, I said, Hey, uh, how, how do you get into this? You know, and he, he gave me Charlie Fulton's phone number. He said, tell him I sent you called Charlie. I went down, I tried out in February and it was I, the, the cost at that time was like $1,700. So I didn't have much money. I was only 19 years old and I was, you know, college kid. So I, I kind of pulled my money together. I took on a second job making pizzas and I made payments to them and I, and plus I needed money for gear and you need to get boots. You needed to get, you know, all that good stuff. Cause they wouldn't just let you put on a pair of tennis shoes and wrestle. They do that today, yeah. but they wouldn't do it back then. <laughs> and especially if Charlie was going to train me and send me off to work. So that, that's how I got started. What happened was I drove down there with a friend to check it out and I tried out and I was, I was so nervous because I'm here. It is, this is my dream. This is what I want to do. And could you imagine if you go and try it and then they come, get out of here, <laughs> you're, like, you're not, you're not worth anything. You're not going to do it. You're never going to get anywhere. Pressure. It was, it was pressure, but you know, I had to know. So I went through with it anyway. I was scared, but I did it. And he pulled me aside and he goes, when can you start? I was like, Oh, I could do this. Oh, great. Okay. So, so I talked to my parents, pulled it together. My parents thought I was crazy. My brother thought I was wasting my time and I was crazy. And it was, that was it. I started with him in April of 93. I tried out in February. Um, uh, by May of 94, 
I had my first TV taping with the WWF and I ended up wrestling Bob Holly. So once I appeared on television nationwide, they, my parents saw me on TV and my family saw me on TV. They said, okay, they kind of saw, okay, he's going somewhere with this. They kind of backed off and they went, he's actually doing something. He's accomplishing something. They had to see it to believe it. So, and I put in the work. That was it. It was hard. I mean, it was really hard. It was a lot harder than I thought it would ever be, but I kind of understood it wasn't going to be easy. So, but you know, that's where I'm at. <laughs> yeah. It was a very quick turnaround though from starting train in 93 and then being on TV for WWF in 94. Like that's crazy yeah. fast. Well, I, I picked it up fast. That's what they, what, what, the thing was, I just remember a quote from Rip Rogers. If you have some athletic ability, above average intelligence, common sense, and a very hard work ethic, you can make money into this business. And I had all that. So I wasn't a great athlete. I was a little bit above average when I was younger. Today, I probably can't jump as high or run as fast in my 50s, but who can? So especially when you beat up your body the way we do. But, but that's what it was. I had the work ethic. I put in the work. Um, my first match was two months of training. I worked in front of people, which is like lightning quick today. Most guys, they'll, they'll train for years before they work a match in front of people. I don't understand that. I'm like, that's how you learn. That's how you get good is you need to wrestle in front of people. You need to work matches in front of people. You, you, it just, it, just the experience goes a long way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was my first match. So yeah, Charlie wouldn't have sent me if he knew I, if I wouldn't have, uh, cause they, what, how it worked was Tony Guerrero, the road agents at that time would call him. And say we need guys. We're going to be in the area. We need guys. So, yeah, that was that's how yeah, it, that's I, that's how it happened. Yeah, I actually interviewed Tony Gurria as well um, at the end mm -hmm. of last year. Uh, what was he like to work with? I know you said you weren't really working with Vince that much. It was kind of no, no. He he was the one I talked to the most. Um, him, Strongbow, and Goulet were the three agents that I talked to. He was he was he was just a business guy. You know, I, I never either. Uh, <laughs> there's a quick story about him. Um, he was, he was, yeah, he was, he was a good, he was a good guy. He was a business. He, he was there to do his job and Hey, be ready when you're supposed to be. So that I learned that this was, uh, I want to say it was God, 96, uh, it was late 96. We're, we were in West Virginia. It was myself and my, my then tag partner, Frank, who I'm still friends with today. He was the best man at my wedding. Um, cool. we're, we're, we weren't on the board. We're sitting there. One of the other guys left. His name was Tom Brand. He's like, oh, I'm not on the board. I'm out of here. So he picked up his bag and left halfway through the show. We're like, we looked at him. We're like, hey, we're not on the board either. Should we go? So we picked our bags. We went in the locker room. We grabbed our bags and we left. And then Korea stopped us at the door. He said, I'm putting you on the board. Don't leave. <laughs> we need a match. We might need a match. So we were on standby the rest of the show. And we both we, we both walk into the locker room and all the boys just started laughing. <laughs> they caught you. They caught you. <laughs> he tried to sneak out and they caught you. So he was mad. <laughs> he was mad. I said, but I apologize. So I said, hey, we saw Tom leave. We thought we could go. And he's like, he just threw up his hand and said, look, just but next time, just come to me before you leave. I'm like, okay. Yeah. That was it. And it was it. it, it he, he, he didn't want to be stuck in a over the barrel because there we hey we there's a problem we need to throw a match out there but sometimes that happens there's there was camera problems anything technical yeah, something and technical, of course, anything could go wrong yeah so yeah. that's that's what that was and of course they were doing multiple tapings back then as well so they might record maybe two or three shows back to back as well wouldn't it uh yeah because i think it was a raw but then they were taping shows after raw so we didn't leave yeah. until like 12 30 after in the in the morning so we stopped at a truck stop eight and then i you remember those i don't know if you had those in the in ireland where you're at but there are mini thins you can get them at truck stops there's like these pills that they, they wake they keep you awake okay they all, yeah. they're not they're not a, this was 96 so i don't think they're on the market anymore i grabbed i took i took some of those and i had like a thing of mountain dew i drove home to cleveland and I was wired. I was just shaking while driving. <laughs> it kept me awake because I didn't have to worry about it. Yeah, I think people use uh, Monster and Red Bull for that thing, he says, don't they? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, that was before the days of Red Bull was available. So, yeah. So, yeah, so, my wife so texts me while it? she knows I'm doing a podcast. I love it. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. <laughs> <laughs> She's, I'm like, thanks. 
It's um, okay. <laughs> I get I my phone's right here. It's on a stand. I can do it. Well, I could do I can multitask. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, do, you wanna, do, do you want to do you want to do you want to do you want to text that I can cut this bit out? Nah, well no, we're good. We're good. I love okay, it. Cool. No, we're that'll fine. save no, that'll, that'll save me. That'll save me editing. So what yeah, so what's no, it like going into uh, what's it like going into the dressing room then with guys that you know you you're used to seeing watching on tv as a fan and then they're standing beside you what's that like <laughs> it i remember well if you do it enough it's just like going to work it's you're, you're cool about it you don't mark out my first taping was in may of 94 it was at the canton civic arena in canton ohio it was wrestling challenge and i remember on my way there they were telling me hey we're in a van he's like don't freak out when you see these guys don't do you know don't act like a mark don't ask for autographs don't do this we said i said yes i understand don't make charlie look bad just be cool and you know if you want to introduce yourself go ahead but use your real name which i always wrestled under my real name which was easy and uh um that was fine but it was interesting the first time i saw bret hart and i was a fan of his and i turn around and i look and he's there and my eyes got real big and i'm like and I calmed down and went, hey, how you doing? And he smiled. He's like, hey. He kind of knew. He knew, like, oh, you wanted to, but he couldn't. It was just, it was funny. He smiled. He kind of laughed. He's like, all right. He kept himself together. <laughs> you know, he's just, yeah. like, I almost forgot where I was at for a second. I was like, oh, hey, Brett, how you doing? <laughs> like, we're friends or something. But that was it. That was the only thing. I didn't work Brett. I ended up working Bob Holly that night. It, well, then he was Sparky yeah. Plug. I don't know. Have you ever talked to Bob Holly? I haven't talked to Bob Holly, but I hear, obviously, mixed things about him from different people in different eras what was he like with you um he was fine i think what it was um he was new and he was really like nervous and green he i think he even talked about this on other podcasts that he hated it when it was there because he thought he was one bad match away from getting fired so he felt like he was under a lot of pressure and um and I'm sitting here thinking, like, I remember being told because I had him that Chris Hammer kind of gave me the heads up that he's not good at calling spots. Be prepared. And just and the rings were so big, like if he couldn't get it out while he, while he threw you off the ropes, you could see him. You could see what he was doing and then go, go with what he was doing. So that pretty much happened. And I started talking him through stuff and um, it, it worked out fine. And him and I, him and I, were, we get along now. I mean, I haven't talked to him in forever i haven't seen him since the last time i was there which was in god it was 23 years ago it was in uh 2000 end of 2000 i i left after cornet left because cornet was the guy that called me and brought me in all the time at that time yeah yeah and um yeah, so, did you ever have any interactions interactions or meet uh hulk hogan at any point with no hogan wasn't there hogan was at wcw at the time never did okay. um never had actions or reactions with piper or, or savage um trying to think but probably the most famous guy I ever wrestled you could, well you could say the two was i wrestled steve austin in 96 and yeah, that was I'll right before he, he wrestled bret hart at survivor series i took that as a compliment they came up to me Goulet did and said, uh, you want to wrestle Stone Cold Steve Austin tonight? And I said, sure. Because I knew they were pushed, they're about ready to push him against Brett for Survivor Series. So this match is going to air nationally a few weeks just before Bret Hart against Bret Hart on Survivor Series. You know, yeah. And Steve was amped. He was amped up for that match. <laughs> I was like, for a second yeah. there, I thought I pissed him off. I was like, but I said, oh, he's just laying it in. <laughs> he was doing the Texas style. <laughs> Vince Vince made him apologize to me, and I told him it wasn't even needed. I said we're cool. Really, I appreciate what it. Happened, yeah. What happened? Well, he was laying it in because I remember I got to the I got to the locker room, I got through the locker room, and Jake Roberts comes up to me. He's like, "Stay right here." He goes, "You okay? You okay?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I'm fine." Well, what's going? I'm like, "What's going on?" He's looking at me, and then I saw I look I could see out of the corner of my eye. I could see Vince was like basically reading Steve Austin the Riot Act. And then I'm like, he told me to stay there, and I waited. And I thought, I thought, okay, we're gonna have to redo this. We're gonna have to do the match over again. They weren't happy with it, which I was ready to go if I had to. Uh, but Steve came up to me, shook my hand, and said, "I'm sorry if I was stiff with you out there." And I shook his hand. And I said, "It's not a problem. I'm here to put you over. I'm fine." That's what I. And that was it. And then I looked over, at, and he walked away, and I looked over at Jake. Jake's like, "Go ahead." That was it. <laughs> That's. I was like, "Oh, okay." Uh, like that's it yeah and, you know and, that's like okay i thought you, i did something wrong <laughs> did, did, 
Did you feel that he was stiff with you that, in that match? No, it didn't bother me. Yeah. I was, I, you know, yeah. I was just like, hey, you're, this is for TV. Lay it in. I'm fine. You can, you, I mean, yeah. I mean, he, he wasn't trying to hurt me. If he wanted to hurt me, he could have, but he didn't. So, and I, him and I, we, him and I got along great after that. I think, I think he appreciated it. Oh, this guy's not a total pussy. Great. <laughs> you know, it's just, <laughs> you'd be surprised how many wrestlers I've run into that are just complete wimps and pussies about certain things. There's certain guys that did not want to get touched. I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. <sighs> because there was a day and a time. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, man. It's a different, it's a different, it's a different business now, isn't it? Compared to what it was. You know, yeah, when, I, when, when I talk to guys like you, people, people always address someone that can wrestle them and it make it look real is they wrestle yeah. snug. And I think that's what, that's what a lot of guys say. And that means it, it looks good. It looks like they're yeah. giving it all, even if they're not, you know? Yeah. My, uh, a good way of putting it, like what they, they just did the dark side of the ring this past, this week was about Matt Bourne. And he did. He made it look so. He laid it in. I mean, he was, and I, I, I my, I, I recorded my podcast with Corey Castle last night. I have a Matt Bourne story. And if anybody wants to hear the whole thing, I met him in 95 when he was still doing Doink at an independent show. It was in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. And a lot of the guys were afraid to approach him and talk to him, I guess, because <laughs> they, they thought he was crazy. He's out in the parking lot. He's, he's, he's dressed up like Doink. He's out in the parking lot smoking a cigarette. And he's basically just kind of sitting on the back of a back car bumper and leaning against the glove, uh, the trunk. And he's just smoking a cigarette. I just walked up to him and said, Hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. I'm Lou. He's like, oh, Matt. And we just, we talked for maybe about 10 minutes. And I, the first thing I brought up to him was I said, you know what? I got to tell you, man, I always liked watching you work, especially your match with Steamboat at the first WrestleMania. And he kind of looked surprised at me. Like you remember that, <laughs> you know, he, he, in other words, I, he, I guess he, I let him know that I was actually a student of the business and I got it. And I said, Hey, I've been working for about two years. You know, you know, I want to pick your brain if you don't mind. He said, sure. He appreciated me doing that. And he's like, you know, that's how you learn is by talking to these guys and listening to them. And he was kind of telling me, you know, make it look like a shoot, make it look like a shoot. Yeah. If you don't, you know, in other words, if you're not, if you don't believe in what you're selling, they're not going to buy it. And I was like, okay, thanks. And he shook my hand. He goes, you're going to make it kid. I swear to God, he said that to me He goes, you're going to make it. Cool. He shook my hand. Cause I, cause, because I approached him and talked to him. Nobody else in that locker room did that. I did it. And I, I just, I wasn't, not that I wasn't afraid to approach him. I said, if you go up to somebody and you're respectful and you're wanting to learn, there's a way of doing it. You introduce yourself, yeah. you, you'd be cool. And he seemed like he was just sitting there. He wasn't talking to anybody. He just, he was by himself. So, and that was, yeah, that was almost 30 years ago. Well, but, I yeah. haven't, I haven't seen, I haven't seen the episode yet, but I've heard, I've heard good things about it. I'm looking forward to watching it. that one. That one was a good episode and it's, it's really, um, I didn't know about the suspicious circumstances of his death because once you hear a wrestler overdoses, you're like, Oh, here we go again. You know, how many times have you yeah, heard that? Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. 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 So um, yeah, there's suspicious circumstances with that, but go right ahead, man. Yeah. Another guy you wrestled in 96, um, marvelous Mark Merrow, as he was known back then. What was he like? Yeah. Oh, he's a great guy. Oh my God. He was, he's one of the nicest people I ever met. Um, he, he was still with his wife, Sable, then wife Sable. And she was really cool with me as before she got really big and famous and things yeah. changed her. Um, but he was, yeah. I mean, we actually said a prayer before we went out in a gorilla position. We all held hands and said a prayer. And cause see, I had two matches on that show and, uh, I had to wrestle the smoking guns with Frank and yeah. they had Sonny and then there, a, a match happened and then they sent me back out again after I was concussed. <laughs> they sent me back out Jeez. there again. Christ. Oh yeah. With, with Mark Merrill. But you know, back then you just kind of, you, sh you just kept going. You didn't think about that stuff. Nobody did. Yeah. You know, they wouldn't today. I would have been sitting, I would have been sitting with a, you know, with a soft drink, watching the monitor, the rest of the night with an ice pack on the back of my head. <laughs> they wouldn't have sent me back yeah. out there to work another match. But I, but I went out there and uh, well, Mark watched that match. He was okay. That was good. Cause we kind of went over what we were going to do, came back and he wasn't supposed to, he was only supposed to work like 
the third hour of the taping. So I said, man, the third hour. So they kind of moved that match up to get it done with. And uh, we, we worked, you know, we went out there, we did about a good four or five minute match. Oh, the other thing too, he appreciated from me was he, he just started doing that shooting star press for the finish at the time. Cause he did it against gold dust at the uh, pay-per-view uh, that was in Cleveland. And I was one of the Druids in Cleveland for that SummerSlam. And um, I saw him do that. So I told him, I said, Hey, do that. I'll take it. And he looked at me, he goes, are you sure? And I said, yeah, absolutely. This is for TV. You, you, you're trying to sell tickets. Let's do it. <laughs> and he appreciated it. I got him over. If you, if you, yeah. if you do the spots that get the other guy over they they really appreciate that. They really do. That's how you get, a, get ahead in the business is by willing to give and make other guys look good. You could do it with, yeah. and, and they'll, they'll, help, they'll return the favor. Most of them anyway. So, yeah. Talk to me about just what you said there about being concussed in one match and then going out and doing another match. Did you, was yeah. that a decision that you, was that a decision that you made or what way did that I don't work? think they, well, I, I'm trying, you know, my, my memory's fairly vague from that because I couldn't even tell you what happened most of the time that match. Uh, but I was, I, I saw, cause I saw the white flash from the smoking guns when they hit me with the leg drop. Boom. And, uh, and I was kind of, I, what I did was I, I, I just put my head in a sink and just kind of got wet and I just got my faculties and the agents like, you ready to go? And I said, yeah, I'll go. So that's just one of those things. You just kind of went through it. I didn't tell them I couldn't go. I didn't say anything to anybody. I just went ahead and did it. So, yeah. Yeah. You just, you the, the whole, go ahead. No, 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 no. You, you, you just, it was just like, you know, you had a beer and th- took some ibuprofens and you were fine. <laughs> it was yeah, like that. That's, you weren't, you weren't, wrestling wasn't the only sports back then that was like that, you know, and things have obviously evolved and changed now with concussions and mm-hmm. things like that in yeah. the business, which is great. But um, you, you've done a few matches then in up until 97, towards 99 then as well. Um, you wrestled Ron Simmons in one match. What was, oh, what yeah. was Ron like? Ron was great. Uh, the, the Ron was amazing. You know what he did? He gave me a two count. That was my hometown in Cleveland. I had uh, I left comp tickets for my sister, brother in law, and then three year old nephew. He's twenty six now, and he has a kid. <laughs> Unbelievable! <laughs> it's like you're feeling old. Oh, I, I, dude, I am. I'm just, I am old. I'm fifty. So. Um, he it was 98 yeah he, he so I, well I, it, the funny story was is i got there before frank did it was in cleveland <laughs> and korea comes up to me and goes who do you want to get beat up by tonight ron simmons or vader i said ron <laughs> i said ron simmons oh, God. good decision good and, decision and frank got vader <laughs> frank said he wasn't too bad he's like oh he wasn't as bad as last time he's i already worked him once i said yeah and you're gonna work him again i'm not getting in there with that ring with that guy crazy <laughs> leon fuck that <laughs> self-preservation yeah Yeah. because so i I had um, bob go ahead i I was just saying yeah i said i had bob cook from wcw on the show and he absolutely fucking hates vader he said he he had the same choice that you did do you want to go in with vader fuck no i'm not going in vader well he he hurt people he deliberately hurt people which no you see it did you see anything happening in wwf like that no no he, he no um but I, I just avoided him. I just like, I'm not going to talk to this guy. I mean, that's just, he, 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 I remember he broke a kid's back at WCW, didn't he? Yep. And a few noses, a few jaws. Ugh. Why? Stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, the whole point is to make it look like you killed him, but you don't. <laughs> it's, that's, yeah. And, and Lord rest his soul. I don't mean to talk bad about the dead. I mean, I, I understand, but I, I remember, um, Brian Costello. Do you remember him? Or do you know who I'm talking about? He, Brian he is a, supposed to be on my podcast next week. Tell him I said hello. I love Bro, him. Brian is He's one of those guy. people, and he might see this, That's it's taken about a year now, but he says next week will be good. <laughs> <laughs> Brian's a good guy, man. I tell him I said hi. I yeah. love him. But he was he, he we were talking. We were sitting there in the locker room, and something with Vader was like, yeah, I wish I was there when Orndorff beat him up. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that would have been fun to see because Orndorff just doesn't take shit. I guess from what I heard, Orndorff whooped his ass. And um, yeah, 
And or and Orndorff, and Orndorff had his flip flops on. That's what I, I don't know if that's true or not. But yeah, Orndorff was a guy you didn't mess with. And I never worked with Paul, never met Paul. I would have loved to have. But interesting though. Was this <laughs> was this the story of uh, Paul Orndorff um, beating him up in the hotel room? Wasn't it? I, I think it was at the TV taping where oh, something. Story. Yeah, yeah, because he wasn't around for his interviews, and he was trying to tell him to go do it. And he wouldn't do it, or he just was being a jerk, and he thought he could push Orndorff around, and Orndorff took exception to it and kicked his ass. <laughs> I guess Leon left after that. Yeah, I, 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 I wasn't there. I didn't see it, but that's the story I heard. But uh, excellent, excellent. Always good um, stuff. I got you wrestled. I got you wrestled in 1999. Andrew Martin test sadly passed yes. away very, very young mm -hmm. as well. He was a great what guy. What was he like? He was yeah. easy. Easy to work with, great guy. Uh, if you you will know this that I don't think anybody at WWF ever had any heat with me or any problems with me. I came there, I did my job, kept my mouth shut, and that was that. Um, I'm trying to think, the only guy I didn't personally like at that time, and I tell it all the time, is Shawn Michaels because he'd walk by you as if you weren't even there. That's the way he was back then. I believe he's changed now. Better guy, fine, great. But that's I'm just being honest at that time. And when and he'll, he'll probably admit to it if he met, I just like, yeah, yeah whatever, dude. Oh, uh, one other guy too is Mark Henry at that time. It was in '96. He, I, I didn't like him either. And I guess um, some of the boys didn't either at the time because he came in, he didn't pay his dues. He thought he was in this, that, and the other. And they kind of had to set him straight. And I think he changed as he got experienced and trained. But the, the one story about him, I think that was the night I wrestled Steve Austin. And um, uh, I was looking on the board to see my name and when I was going up and everything. And he kind of walked, Mark Henry walked by me and threw his shoulder into me. And I took a step back and I looked at him. I was like, I went, fuck you. <laughs> he just looked at him like, like, and he just stopped and he turned around and said, before you take another step, I know how to wrestle and you don't. That's what I said to him. And he just wow. kept walking and he just kept walking. And I remember some of the people saw it and I'm like, I said, believe that motherfucker. And that's what I kind of said, but they were kind of like, Hey, I stood up for myself. That was me standing up for myself. Nobody said a word to me after that. Like, hey, okay. He stood up for himself. That was it. And he wasn't going to take his shit because he thought, Oh, well, here's a, he's just an, uh, you know, he's an enhancement guy. He's a job or I could just do that. I could walk by and just throw a shoulder into him. I didn't know him from Adam. Like, if you're my friend, I would have laughed. I would have like, yeah, all right, whatever. It would have been a joke, but I didn't know him. I wasn't friends with him, and uh, so, that was so it. He obviously, yeah, he obviously came into the business then as as an outsider, we'll say from Olympics and whatever, and came mm -hmm. in with an ego then, which wouldn't have went down well in the dress room. No, no, it doesn't. It, it, if he was humble and he was polite and he was listening and trying to learn and you know, treating other people as if they were better than him, he would have been okay at the beginning, but no, he had to learn the hard way from my understanding. And he did. So yeah. it's, he, he had a good career. Good for him. You know, he's a, he had a yeah. big, strong guy. I mean, no doubt about it, but I, I, I mean, you gotta, if you don't stand up for yourself, they're going to, they're going to walk all over you. And yeah. that, that I was clear, I was ready to throw if I had to, because I just said, no, 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 you're not doing that. And, and I was three years into the business and I knew, and I knew that. So that, I don't know if that got me any more respect, but everybody was cool with me. Nobody came up to me and said anything about it later. Nobody said either way. Nobody said a word to me about it. It's like, yeah, it was, it was really, it would happen fast and it was quick, but I, yeah. it's, it's one of those, oh, am I going to get fired for that? Why? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't. So it was good. <laughs> That other man you mentioned there, Shawn Michaels, did you ever have any interactions with him or was he just no. doing his own thing? No, he was he's just doing his own thing, walked by as if you weren't even there. He just was a prick. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> he was just a prick. And you the know, thing was, he, he was he, he was full of himself, but Jesus Christ, he 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 was on top of the world. He had all the talent in the world. And I, I, he's a great, very talented guy. I, I I will not take that away from him, but as a person, I use a prick. Yeah. Do you know? Do you know Casey Thompson? Doesn't sound familiar. Okay, he was he was involved in the WWF in in an enhancement talent role around that time as well, and he said the exact same thing to me about three weeks ago. He's a prick. Uh, 
Yeah. So he must have had the same kind of experience yeah. then that you had. What, what area of the country was Casey Thompson? Because what they would do is they'd bring guys in in the area. I'm not sure, but I can find out for you because America. Okay, I'm just so, curious because we might have yeah. met, and I, I, I might not just remember. We could have met, yeah. Well, did he was you in ever WCW see... as well, so he okay. could have been okay. switching between both. He might have been, yeah. I don't. We we could have crossed paths at some time. We probably did if it was at that time. Just uh, we might. Oh uh, yeah, I kind of. I remember the guy's name vaguely. Uh, the the one guy. Uh, did you ever see the uh, doc? Uh, Bigger, faster, stronger. The documentary about no. Mike Bell, the wrestler. He's he's one of the. It's it's actually his brother David. Did it, and it was about steroids and everything. But his brother Mike was a wrestler. And I met my, it was Mad Dog Mike Bell. I, I met him up in uh, Syracuse, New York, because they're from Poughkeepsie, New York. That family yep. was. So, yeah, that, that, because when I saw it, when I watched it in 2007, I said, oh, yeah, I know Mike. I met, I met him. So sometimes when you see their face, you might, oh, yeah, I know who he is. It might be more of a, a face thing versus a name. That's my point. <laughs> so, yeah. In, in around 2000, then you got a serious back injury. What happened? And uh, where did it happen? How did it happen? Oh, wow! You did your homework. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Long story short. Long story short, I was chronically having spasms in my lower back, and what doctors were doing for me, they were. I went through the routine every time I went in. I had to urinate in a cup to make sure there's no blood. I had to do this, take an X-ray. They'd give me muscle relaxers and painkillers. Well, eventually. I built up a tolerance to them. So what they said to me was, well, we'll give you something stronger. I went, no, no, I don't want any more pills. Let's figure this out. And she paused and she went, would you try physical therapy? I said, yes, let's try that. So they got me to a physical therapist at Metro Health, Hosp Metro Health Systems in Cleveland. And um, the guy's name was Tim Walsh. And he put my, he had me on, laying on a table with, with my feet flat, my knees up. And he said, uh, he looked at my knees and he, he grabbed my ankles and he was looking. He said, he goes, your right leg is a half of an inch longer than your left leg. I said, what? He said, your right leg is a half an inch longer than your left leg. I was like, how did that happen? He goes, well, you take a lot of slams and a lot of falls. And over time, that the joint between your hip and your, your upper leg was slipping. And your back's out of whack. And that's why it's the muscles are trying to correct themselves is why they're, they're, they're doing that. So I did physical therapy for a year to correct it and to strengthen the muscles around it to hold it in place. And that's what I had to do. And I was on the shelf for about, well, I was on the shelf a little bit longer than I wanted to be because after, after that happened, you know, I kind of went on and did other things and I had, I bought a house. I had all these other things going on and I, I kind of stayed on the shelf until about 2005. And I did some local stuff in Cleveland for about a year. And then I put, then I sat back down and I waited. And I think it was about two or three years later, I said, I'm going to make a run. I just kind of, I still had that itch. I was, I was, I was quite, I was like in my mid thirties. I said, I'm young enough. I could still do this. So it was around 2008, 2009 is when I started training again and went back full go and, and, and really, uh, really pushed hard at that point. So I kind of, kind of tell you the story by me saying no more pills, my life could have gone, gone a totally different trajectory. And I could have been a dark side of the ring episode because <laughs> yeah. that leads to addiction. And I knew of course, that. Yeah. I, I knew that. I well, knew the house, I, go ahead, sir. You're you're saying as well, like um, you know, you built up a tolerance to them. So to, so, what's the point in taking them if you have a tolerance to them as well? You know. Yeah, yeah, see, they were going to give me something stronger. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Well, the house I grew up in, my mother was worked at a hospital, and she was in the pharmacy. She was a pharmacy tech, and my father was a uh, maintenance mechanic at a at a plant in Solon, Ohio. So. The house I grew up in, the way they were is like, you take your medicine exactly as it's prescribed to you. You don't take any medicine unless you need to. And that's it. So I had that embedded in me. It was like, this isn't right. This isn't right. Like if one or two is 
good for you, then four would be even better. You know, no, no, that's not how I was raised. So that, that, that part, it gave me enough sense to know. Yeah. Yeah. This is going to, this is a slippery slope. I don't want to end up down this path. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it says online, you've done a bit of work with ECW as well. What, oh, what kind mm-hmm. of work did you do there? I, I was pretty, I, I was, a. Uh, I, I had some matches that were more competitive. I would say, especially uh, my first ECW match was against uh, Bam Bam Bigelow. And I okay. just kind of tell you the story, how that happened. I can't, I was there for about six months um, and how it works with them and anybody else that's worked there would have told you, you kind of show up and then they use you. <laughs> it's what it is, <laughs> it's how it works. You just keep showing up. Oh, okay. You keep showing up. But then if you're paying your own way and showing up, if they use you, they pay. If they don't use you, you're on your own. It's like, well, can you afford to do it? Can you keep doing it? And I, I was going all the way from Ohio to Philadelphia. But what I did, they, they had a show in Pittsburgh, and I was over huge in Pittsburgh at the time. I was one of their top guys locally. But I didn't say that to anybody when I was there. And I Taz wasn't at that show, but it was at the Golden Dome. And I got there, and Meanie, Brian Heffron, Blue Meanie, fr- I was good friends with him. He introduced me to Paul. I brought my gear they do a workout with Tracy Smothers. So I worked out with Tracy. He, he was looking at me and he's like, I want to see you work. Let's see what you can do. I worked out with him and it was like, it was like 110 degrees in there. Did the workout. I went over, say, Hey, thank you. Uh, you know, and everything. And he says, Hey, you're working tonight. You're hired. That's what Heyman told me. And I ended up working bam, bam. And I did the match with him. Uh, then I kept going back and I did some more, did some more work. I worked guys like Paul diamond, Al snow, uh, Axel rotten job, Balls Mahoney. Those are the guys I pretty much worked with when I was there. Danny Doring a couple of times. Um, I'm trying to think who else. I don't think I worked with Chetty. Or I might have. I'm trying to remember. But those are the guys I worked with usually. I didn't uh, do anything major. But after about six months, I had a choice. It was I could either keep going out there or I could, I could, I had, I had, I, had, I met with guidance counselors. I was going to college. I, I had, I had all my money saved up. I could, I was still living at home because I was never home. <laughs> So my parents were like, you know, stay here. You know, you don't have to, you're always gone. You're always either working, you're wrestling, you're at school. And I said, well, I could be done with college in, in, in 18 months. Uh, actually it was like 16 months. I was done with college and it was more like 15 or 16 months. So I, cause I had to go through the summer and, and just busted it out. Like took one extra class a semester, go through two summer sessions, could bust out two years worth of school in 15 months. And I said, so I wanted to do it. I told Paul Heyman, I said, look, I'm going to go finish college. I'll give you a, I'll, I'll, I'll start coming around when I'm, when I'm done. He said, Hey, good luck to you. He thanked, you know, he's like, it was fine. No hard feelings. I just went ahead and did it. And, um, when I, uh, got, when I was done, by the time I was done is when ECW started going downhill, <laughs> like checks were bouncing and financial stuff. You're just hearing all these rumors. And I'm like, yeah. Cause what I did was I, I kept it local and independence and WWF stuff when they're in the area while i was going to school so yeah yeah so yeah. that that was that was always the fun times <laughs> but yeah i had a great i learned a lot there when i was there fun fun experience what was the what was the dressing room like there in ecw compared to the wwf one <laughs> uh, it was a lot more fun um let me just say yeah. this uh how can i put it i'm just gonna be honest i don't even the, the amount of drugs going through that locker room astonished me it just it's it scared the shit out of me i was like i just all the drugs and everything i'm like that and i'm not i never did drugs i'm not a drug guy you know i was a drinker i'd I'd hang out and i drink with them but i wouldn't do anything else so Mm -hmm. and uh probably you know meanie was my good friend um thinking uh who else well you know uh cody michaels and shane i got along with well there uh, francine is a sweetheart i loved her she her and i got along great yeah she was and, great on tv as well yeah her her and i yeah i know i know she she has a son now and everything i think she actually remembered me because she liked something dave Meltzer said something about her on twitter and i responded with this i said dave Meltzer never put on a pair of wrestling boots in his life yeah yeah and that's all i said and she liked it she said hey i hope you're doing well i was like thanks thanks man you know that that was nice that she kind of remembered me but it was i was only there for a short period of time but she was great i'm trying to think who else was there. beulah was there too mcgillicuddy i haven't seen her in forever um 
Yeah, I got along with pretty much everybody. You you might be able to count on one hand. There you go, one hand of people that might not have liked me or not been around me. But most that's back then. The newer guys today, they fucking hated me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Because I was old school. I don't believe in the stupid shit that they're doing. The Joey Ryan stuff pissed me off to no end. Ah, uh, he's a it, fucking idiot anyway. Oh, uh, he well, oh, well, when the stories came out about him, I was like, no, no shit, idiots. You know, he's he's, he's on Twitter going, well, equal rights to women. I said, this is wrestling. What are you doing? And then meanwhile, he was a pervert and he's basically sexually harassing all these women. I was in the business for 25 years. Okay. I was involved in the business for 25 years. You will never hear a story about me sexually harassing a woman in the locker room. Okay. You won't. Yeah. Never hear it. As it should be. Because it never happened. It never happened. Well, at that time too, and I'm going to be honest, I'm married now. I have two daughters. Back then I was single. Back then, I was young, athletic, single guy, a wrestler, good looking. Guess what happened? Women came up to me. They approached me. I never made anybody do anything they didn't want to do. I have I had a high body count, okay, but I didn't have Ric Flair numbers <laughs> Let's go there. <laughs> or Ricky Morton numbers. But who? But damn, who does? You know, God, yeah. I'm not Will Chamberlain, yeah. but I had my fair <laughs> share. And well, it, but. That was different because I didn't have to hit on any of the women in the locker room because I could go out after the show because they knew where the wrestlers were. They knew where we went to hang out. I had my pick. If I wanted it, that's how it was there. I didn't have to, you know, it made no sense. And plus, I'm not yeah. going to get myself fired <laughs> to, to do to. And plus, most of the time when there's a woman on the show at somebody's girlfriend, somebody's wife, somebody's daughter, exactly. you know, she's there with somebody. Somehow. And plus, back then, back then, the ratio of men as to women wouldn't have been great either. We wouldn't have liked to have been battling and something like that as well. Nah, nah, it's not my. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. It's not gonna waste my time with that shit. So it didn't yeah. matter. It's, it, uh, it's 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 like you know when you go to like sometimes I go out with different people and there's always the one guy that thinks he can get with the the bar the the girl behind the bar, isn't there? kind of comparable to that <laughs> the girl behind the bar yeah drinking a guinness yeah. Yeah. The girl, yeah, there's... but what I, what I what i say to guys is the girl behind the bar gets chatted up every minute of every day by several different people you're wasting your time yeah what do you, you know? have that's that any different than they are than they are yeah unless she comes to you and starts showing interest in you you might as well different yeah. story different story um yeah and i uh, got it would have made no sense to do that. But like the guys today, like, like there was, I, I was talking on my, um, on my, on my podcast, the stew pot on rumble. We were talking about, there was a guy, there was a, there was a reel on Facebook of a guy taking a hurricanrana from an eight year old girl at a show in front of people. He, he, he was trying to give her a power bomb. She, she jumped the rail, got into the ring, obviously was a part of the show, picked her up to hit her and she her Quran at him. And he put in the comments of the reel saying, I was assaulted by a fan that jumped the, that jumped the rail. I'm going to press charges and I'm pro like tongue in cheek sarcasm. And I'm like, dude, you just look like a total pussy getting taken down by an eight year old girl. And you're going to take a stunner from a, from a girl scout next month. What do you, I mean, what are you doing? It, it, it was terrible. Does, yeah. does that sell tickets? The people that no, thought that was you. cool and funny, no, no, it doesn't. The people that thought that was cool and funny are going to show up anyway. They're going to buy a ticket anyway. You're trying to get more people to come. That's not going to do it. And if they want it, they want to call me an old codger. Yes, I am an old codger. Yes, I am old school. Back then, you know, sorry, you're, it's not going to work out. And they'll probably pull yeah. up shit up some stupid shit that I did, but I never put over a kid in the middle of the ring in front of people. Yeah. <laughs> What's when when you were there we'll say in that in the wwf in obviously you wrestled steve austin before they pulled the trigger on him and then they were going into all this kind of edgy stuff in the attitude mm -hmm. era what was it like what was it like being in that environment did you ever felt that oh maybe they're going too far with things or that because i know you're taking the business seriously <laughs> so did you find they got the right balance with all the kind of comedy and yeah. mad shit that we're doing yeah you know what it was I didn't agree with it. Sometimes they never asked me specifically to do anything that I wasn't comfortable doing. So, you know, they didn't say, Hey, go out there and get your bare ass bank in the middle of the ring. They never asked me to do anything like that. 
which I wouldn't thank have done. God. So thank God. Yeah. I wouldn't have done it. I would have been, I was like, yeah, I'll take my bag and I'll go home. No, thank you. You know, well, th I just thought if the, as long as there's, cause the problem is if you say no to something, there's a line of guys outside that desk, outside that door, that are willing to do sure. it. Yeah. And you know, your spot could be taken. So you're under a lot of pressure to say yes, even though you don't want it to, or don't agree to it. Um, yeah, I thought, you know, the one of the things that I thought was really, I lost a lot of respect for that company when they did it was Owen Hart, how they yeah. handled that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was actually, I was almost sickened by it. It just that they, they should have stopped the show and just, you know, they, they went live the next day. They did the whole thing about them. Yeah. You know, that, that was just horrible to keep the show going like that. How can you go out there and work a match after they just wheeled out another a dead wrestler? So go on, go, go, go. You know, that's, I, I think that'll come down. That'll come down as probably one of the most questionable decisions that Vince ever made, you know? Yeah, I agree. And I, and, and the other one too was, um, um, Brian Pillman's widow. Mm, I, I, yeah. I wrestled, I wrestled Pillman two months before he died. I mean, you probably see it there. I, I it was in Pittsburgh. I wrestled yeah. that was, yeah. I want to say that was 97. He, yeah, it was in July of 97. He was dead in September. And my thing, he was, he was really cool with me. We, we got along great. We did the match and everything. He should not have been in that ring. He was in no condition to be doing that. Cause he was later on, um, I'm in the locker room with my friend Frank that I talked about earlier and we can hear him dry heaving in the bathroom. Brian Pillman. Ah, ah, ah. We're just like Frank and I are looking at each other and you look across the locker room and there's Mick Foley and Shawn Michaels talking to each other, acting like we thought, do should we get somebody? So, you know, is this guy going to be okay? <clears throat> and um, yeah, he just kept going. He just, you know, just kept going and kept taking those drugs and eventually got, it got the better of him and it took his life. And he would, if he would have stopped wrestling, he probably would still be alive. He probably would have kept living, but it's a shame. And then they put her on TV after that happened. And it's like, why did you do that? You know, and she, she's trying to figure out how she's going to take care of her family after he dies. I don't, maybe they offered her a nice payoff to do it. I don't know. I don't know what they yeah. did. I know, I know. If you're offered money in a situation like that where you lost someone, you probably would take the opportunity. But I understand what you're saying from a just know, a common decency. Yeah. yeah common See, decency. I'm done. I'm done in this business. I'm not trying to get a job anywhere. They can all fuck off. I'll tell them what I think. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what. I, that's what I love about Jim Cornette. I love it. <laughs> he just, he just yeah. tells him what he thinks. He's like, yeah, yeah. Well, Cornette and I got along great. I love Jimmy. Don't agree with him everything and everything politically, but that's not about politics. It's just about wrestling. I could sit down. I could talk wrestling with him in just hours. We could just have, have drinks and just talk. He'll probably want his Domino pizza and his Sprite. So that's what I'll do. It's a gourmet meal. <laughs> the, the, the classic, the classic uh, Wendy, was was it? No, it was a Dairy Queen drive through <laughs> Did you ever see that clip? No. With Jim no. Cornette. Oh, my God. People, you got to look it up on YouTube. Jim Cornette. Dairy Queen drive through It was in Hyden, Kentucky. It was, it was in the mid nineties with Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And he's standing at the drive through window, cussing out the people inside. <laughs> it's, and he, yeah, that's that, that's a guy. That's the guy. He's, yeah. I'm surprised he hasn't had a heart attack yet because he's wound tight, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, was was 2012 your last appearance or last scheduled appearance for WWF? Because there's a story on the internet as well. We'll go find out if it's true tonight that. Oh, you were yeah, meant to true. make an appearance and there was a problem with paperwork or something. What happened yeah, there? Yeah. That yeah. Um, what it was is I, I worked for him before. I couldn't understand why they were going through this, but through Manny Fernandez, it was like going to be a tryout situation. My understanding. And it was through uh, Manny. So Manny, I worked working with Manny doing wrestling clinics, working with him. And I was, man, I was ready. I, I thought I was feeling great. I was ready to go. And I was about 39 years old. I thought maybe they would have thought I was too old, but who knows, yeah. you know, I'm, you know, it was your second chance after the injury and everything, really. So yeah, it was a chance to do ready, something, ready to, to do something. But I was, I was looking for because I knew the NWA was on the horizon too. I knew that was happening. Um, so I, I, I showed up. It was in Greensboro, North Carolina, and Manny called me and said, "Yeah, you know, send your stuff to Amanda Tuttleson. She'll take care of it. Uh, you, you show up here at this day, wear a suit, 
wearing a suit, which is like, wow, <laughs> didn't have to do that back in the nineties. You showed up in like shorts and tank top and you weren't, you were wearing your fanny pack and your ball cap on, but I said, okay, all right, I'll, uh, I'll show up wearing a suit and was ready to go. And then they didn't have my paperwork. They took me in another room. I was talking to Regal and one guy was in there and he says, would you talk to Amanda? And I said, I said, no, I didn't talk to her. I talked to Manny. Manny told me, well, what does that tell you? He said, tells me Manny talked to her. <laughs> I just was like, really? And I was, I was this close to telling him, I just kind of was looking at him and said, well, it tells me you have never been in the ring. <laughs> I was going to say that yeah. like, fuck you. I, Mark Carano was the guy's name. He was a prick. And Regal, <laughs> Regal was cool with me. Regal was just like, cause he kind of knew. I, I said, look, I wouldn't have come here unless I was supposed to be. I don't just do this. And they said, you got to go. We don't have your paperwork. You can leave. It's like, are you fucking kidding me? Manny didn't do anything. Nobody did anything. And cue ball Carmichael left with me and that was it. I guess the story got out. Nobody said anything. And I was like, all right, that's fine with me. I've, I've, they didn't Strange. want me because it, it was just really, it was, a. I guess from what I heard, it was a mix up in paperwork and you know, I said, fine. And then, um, I, yeah, and I, that, that was it. So that's all I knew was that, that it was, was a mix up in paperwork. Yeah. And that was the last time you were, Yes, Step anywhere near him. Of that company. Yeah, 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 yeah. And anywhere near him. And it was different. God, it felt different. Because I walked in, I see John Cena reading a script. Like they want you to memorize a promo verb, like verbatim, every word, happy, angry, sad, do it. I'm like, what? I mean, I, I wouldn't, I, I never done a promo where I had to memorize every word. I never did that in my career. They just, you know, who, what, where, when, why? You know, like I'm wrestling you at, you know, at the Tokyo, Tokyo Dome on Saturday night, whatever, you know, it's for the world championship, eight o'clock. I'm going to be there and I'm going to kick your ass. That's it. I mean, something yeah. else, instead of going through this whole diet, because that's, they have TV writers. They don't have bookers, you know, they have guys that are trained, but they're not trained. And what I mean by that is there was a day when there was territories when you wrestled every night in front of people for years and you got that experience and you got polished. And by the time you got up to New York, you were ready and you're ready to go. And that's what that, that's what, that's what was missing for the last 30 years in the business easily. 35 years was a territory for guys to learn from. Uh, you know, it would have been smart for Vince to keep Smoky Mountain Wrestling going as a developmental, maybe keep Florida going too as a developmental. So he had places to put people. Hey, we know you need to work on some stuff here. You go here. It's like a minor league. You need that. You need that. And they don't have it. And uh, they, they try once a month's not going to do it. You need at least three or four nights a week in front of people. But I had no hard feelings after that. It was like, hey, you know, I was mad at the time. I was pissed. I was like, I went through all this trouble to go and then it didn't happen and I wouldn't have showed up, but Hey, if yeah. AEW called me and they wanted me to do something for them, I would probably do an office position or something like that if they wanted me to, but nobody's called me from AEW. <laughs> They're like, who's this fucking guy? <laughs> uh, when, when did you officially hang up the boots then? Uh, I dropped the national belt in February of 2015. And that was when my wife went through the first trimester with our first child. So I had another title to drop. It was a Carolina legacy title. I, I dropped that belt and then I hung up the boots, but I did one more match later on that year for a friend for Cuba ball Carmichael's, the buddy Landell tournament. And I put over Tracy Smothers and I did one more benefit show for Zoltan in 2018. And that was it. I haven't, I haven't been in the ring or put on, I still have the boots in the storage room. I, I still have my gear in the storage room. I thought about it. So just in case. Just in case. Well, I actually thought about this. I said, man, wouldn't it be cool? Cause I won a belt in my twenties. I won, I won belts in my twenties. I won belts in my thirties. I won belts in my forties. I just turned 50, you know, could I win a belt in my fifties? You know, could the I do it? Coming you back. Know? Uh, I don't know how to say that. Cause then I wake up in the morning. I'm like, what the hell am I thinking? Uh, <laughs> You know, it's just, I, what, is it really about winning belts or is it about being a good dad and taking care of my family? So yeah. it's, 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 yeah, because if I did any, well, the other thing too is my, my daughters weren't old enough to remember seeing me wrestle. 
they see the pictures, they see the posters, they knew that I did it and they see the belts in, in, in the office and they kind of have an idea, but you know, there's that something about maybe there's something about, and I talked to a lot of guys in your situation as well. There's something about your kids not being old enough and then they are old enough and you kind of want to show them this is what yeah. I've done. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. I could, I could pull up YouTube and stuff. Um, I do have, I did do this though. I don't know if the, did you see anything that I competed as a bodybuilder last year? No, I didn't see that at all. No. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, well, what happened was I was about 2019 and I got, I said, I said, I got to, I got to do something. I want to, I want, I need a mountain to climb. I want to, I want to, I want to do this. And I was talking to my wife about it and I said, well, let me, let me try to compete as a bodybuilder. Let me talk to somebody. So there was a trainer, the company I worked for at a corporate fitness center. And one of the, one of the software people that worked there went to the fitness center and I could tell by looking at him, he was a bodybuilder and he was a trainer. And one of the trainers there said, yeah, talk to him. His name is Scott. And, um, he's the person you need to talk to if you want to do it. And I just want, I just wanted to do it as an amateur just to get on stage and try. And it took me about three years and I was in the masters 40 and over. I took third place in the masters and I took fifth place among the heavyweights. Cause I had to be nice. under 225. Yeah. I had to be under 225. I weighed 223.8. If you look at my Facebook page, it should be on there. Even my Instagram that I did compete. And, but that was just, that was just me. Tr I just needed to do something. I needed a mountain to climb. I needed to, to, to try myself. And I have, I, it's like a medal. I want it. And I gave one to my brother and I get, and I have one here. And uh, yeah, that was, that was the last probably major thing I did. Now, recently, I'm just recovering from hernia surgery. <laughs> I had that in April. <laughs> I, had, I had an umbilical hernia for two years. <laughs> I just kept, I kept pushing right. through it and I finally got it taken care of. So now I'm just trying to get back into shape again. I probably, I'm probably at least 30 pounds heavier than I was then, but Hey, that I, the, my body fat percentage had to be under 6% for that which was like, that wasn't sustained. I, I knew I looked amazing, but I said, this is all I, I knew in my head, it's only temporary. <laughs> I'm not going to look this good. <laughs> but, but if I would have been 13 months older, because it was in May of 2022, if I was 13 months older, I would have been in the 50 and older category. I would have taken first place and I would have qualified for nationals. Wow. It would have happened. Yeah. So it would have been nice, but Hey, you know, that's fine. I did it. So I, I, I put my, I set a goal. I did it. So maybe there's other things I can do. I started doing the show with Corey. Maybe I can get back into the ring. I don't know. I'm, I'm never saying never, uh, but there, you know, there's just, you just gotta just lay things out and go. I've, I've done a little bit of acting too. I was in a movie called red water resurrection and I heard it was terrible. I didn't even watch it. <laughs> It was about a zombie apocalypse <laughs> movie. You could see it on Tubit TV or Amazon prime. I think. If you, I, I don't know if it's on my IMDb page because I guess I have an IMDb page. Um, I did that. I did uh, I did some acting and stuff like that. And so there's always stuff I could try and do. And there's always yeah, things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's there's so much there's so much these days, especially in in, in this in this age as well that you can yeah. get into. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another thing I wanted to talk about just when I was researching this this uh, WWE lawsuit thing where a lot of wrestlers came together over mm -hmm. it was over mostly to do with concussions and your name yeah. associated with that as well uh yes. can you explain to me how that process came about uh through cue ball carmichael bill kairos contacted me and i kind of explained to him my situation things that i've gone through and the symptoms that i've endured since then um i still take prescription medication for the post-concussion syndrome uh, there's times I'll forget things and I'll, I'll get my, my numbers and words, letters backwards at times I sustained at least 13 concussions throughout the business. And, um, I see a neurologist regularly, like once a year, I see, I see a, a dermatologist because of all the tanning I did too, once a year. And I see a doctor once a year too, just to keep my health in order just to make sure I'm staying healthy because my goal is to to live long enough to, to hold my grandchildren. <laughs> That's what I want to do. Cause I have two daughters and yep. the, you know, it, 20 years can fly by quick. I, I'm 50, you know, when I'm 70, I plan on, you know, being retired and having, you know, a homestead and a place to have Thanksgiving dinners and Christmases with the family. That's, that's what I see myself doing. And I, that's, what's important to me. Um, so I wasn't looking for money when I did it. 
but I know there's a lot of wrestlers that didn't do what I did and think for the future because I made sure I got that college education. I still had that good job. I still had that career to fall back on because I knew wrestling wasn't going to go on forever. I wasn't going to be in my twenties forever and I'm okay. Cause one, one of the things Bill Eady told me and he's like, kid, <laughs> make sure you save your money, have health insurance and always protect yourself. So that's what I did. I have a, I have a really good job now. I have a health plan. I have a retirement plan. You know, I have benefits. I have a, you know, it's, yeah, it's an, it's a nine to five home off. It's an office thing. It was an office before, but now I've been working from home for the last three years. Um, that's what I did. So I'm, I'm okay. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm not mean, I'm, I'm I want to say I'm great because I still struggle with things at times. I have hearing loss in my right ear. I have a swollen lymph node in the back of my right behind my right ear from all the chair shots and stuff. Um, but I did it more for everybody else. I said, if putting my name on this helps do it. And I was talking guys like Marty Janetti, or I heard there was guys, I don't know, who, I don't know who all was involved, but I heard there was guys on that that were pretty much living in trailer parks on food stamps. And it's like, you know, they, they, there should be some sort of something in place for them to help them some sort of um, pension or anything yeah. for these guys. And a lot of times you had to do it yourself and you had to plan for the future. Ric Flair did not plan for the future. He knows that he was, if he was here, he'd say it. Uh, I did. And I'm, I'm fortunate enough to do it. And I have a family, but that's, that's why I, I wasn't thinking selfishly. Oh, Vince is going to give me a million dollars. No, I wasn't thinking that at all. I, you know, I, I just wanted to see just to get these guys the help they needed. That's the reason why I did it. The business seems like that it can be cruel at times to different people as well. Like, you know, if someone, someone might reach out for help and they might not get it. And then you see like, superstar billy graham dying and his family trying to fundraise money for his funeral and yeah just yeah. something not there's something not right about the lack of what's the way of doing it like you you work you get a pension you get you get looked after you get something like that you you work in the business back then you get out of it you you mightn't even get royalties or you mightn't even get anything for your figures for your t-shirts whatever just for the amount of hours that get put in, I think a lot of guys get forgotten about, you know, is the point yeah. I'm trying to make. Yeah, well, the, the, and there might have been some fans that didn't even know who he was, you know, superstar Billy Graham. And I remember, yeah, he was he was a star. And he, he it's amazing that he didn't do it. I mean, Dusty Rhodes was another one, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, he passed away. And I think, I know the family was struggling at one point in time. Um, I'm trying to think of who else is because you think you, you don't really understand it that you back, especially back in the day of superstar Billy Graham, they didn't get guaranteed money. You got paid off the house. You got paid off of a paid attendance. That's how you made your money. So you, th those guys, you know, they knew how to make sure you drew money. If it, if, if anybody did something stupid on the show to hurt the house, you, you paid for it because you're hurting everybody else. You're not just hurting you, you're hurting the whole company. That's that's kind of how that's kind of how it works. It's sad uh, because there should be something in place. There should be a program or anything. Yeah. Who knows? Who who knows what could be done? And I would think the smart guys like Bill Eady was very smart. Andre was very smart with his money. And other guys weren't. You know, other guys didn't save, and it showed. And you think you're gonna be making that kind of money living forever, but you never heard of a rainy day. So that's what it's there for. I sad, but I think something should be in place. I agree with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose like we're we're just kind of over the hour now. So what we'll do to yeah. wrap it up is we will <laughs> okay. we will talk about tell people about your podcast. There's only specific places to get it. Tell us yeah. what what's on it, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, it's a, it's a podcast with myself and fellow wrestler, Corey Castle. It's called the Sunday stew pot. It's every Sunday on rumble. Just do the search for the Sunday stew pot. You can find it. And we, we talk once a week, we talk about current events. We talk about wrestling. We talk about, we even bring up politics. It's a stew pot. You can put anything in it. So that's really the understanding is we talk, we even talk about movies. Like we just did a current movie review about Creed three. So we both watched it and we told you what we thought. And the one thing we both had a, one consensus on that movie was it was missing Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> that's the thing. That's what we said. If they had, if they had the Rocky character in it, it would have been a be much better movie. Although it yeah. wasn't bad. I wouldn't say it was bad, but it was, it was missing something and it was Rocky. 
So, yeah. but man, yeah, 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 check it out. You know, be happy to yeah, we welcome aboard. We talk, we are the reason why we're on Rumble is we don't want to be censored. <laughs> so that's it. We don't want to be demonetized or censored. Rumble lets you talk. It's a free speech yeah. platform. We believe in that. So I appreciate it, man. Thank, thanks for having me on. God bless you. Yeah, look, really appreciate it, man. I will get the links off you. I will post your your uh, your podcast underneath that. So if people want to check it out, that they can. Yeah, I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you right now. Much obliged. Yeah. Thanks a million, man. Yeah, take care. <laughs>